In the race for governor, the incumbent, Democrat Governor Tony Evers. Like Senator Johnson, he agreed to an in-depth interview with 12 News. The former state school superintendent is ending a difficult first term, but confident in his bid for another four years. Governor Evers, thank you very much for being with us today. It's great We're to very be happy here. to have you here. Thank you. The governor of Milwaukee is on pace to break its own homicide record, which was just set last year. There is a fear that hasn't been felt before. People are afraid to drive because of reckless driving, afraid to park on the streets, that their car may be stolen, afraid to go to parades. I was wondering, how is your administration addressing those fears, and what can you do to help people feel safe again? Yeah, I think every Wisconsinite deserves to have a safe community to live in, and that whether that's Milwaukee or Crandon. It's, it's the same issue. I think we've made some good faith efforts, but at the end of the day, we need to make sure that uh, Milwaukee and Milwaukee County and the other cities and municipalities and counties across the state have the resources they need. The state's obligation around uh, this particular issue is twofold. I, I do believe we should be looking at some gun safety issues uh, that we have tried before, but you know, if you look at the Marquette University poll, it talks about, you know, if we talk about red flag laws or universal background checks, things like that, most people, including hunters, want that. And so, love to bring, bring that forward. But in the meantime, I also believe that our obligations are being the state to cities and municipalities. They're doing all the hard work. We should be at least putting our efforts around re uh, revenue streams such as shared revenue. I know that's a big thing here in Milwaukee. It's a big thing for me. Over the last 10 years or so, that percentage has actually dropped uh, by, um, uh, by 9%, the amount of money that's going to municipalities, and that's not counting for inflation. For public safety, the costs have gone up 16%. Funding and budgets is an important part of this conversation. Uh, also, are the emotions from these families, the victims, oh. the victims of homicide victims here in the city? Uh, how do you keep in touch, and, and uh, how do you get in touch with with those concerns of the people here in the city? Well, we listen to them. I've, I've been uh, on walks with uh, folks that are uh, are doing the violence prevention work, and I interact with families as as we walk down the street and talking to them about that. It, that is difficult, and I, I don't want to say it's an impossibility to uh, to address these issues, but they're multifaceted. They, they are connected to affordable housing. They are impacted by whether someone has a, a good paying job or the, you know good nutrition in a family. All those things are connected. We need to continue to make sure that we're, we're connecting the dots on that. Public safety, as we know, is a top issue in this campaign for Democrats and Republicans. I, I want to talk about bail. We're in the midst of the Daryl Brooks trial mm -hmm. this month and the Waukesha Christmas parade attack. This brought to light some issues with bail. He was out on what many, including the district attorney, said was an inappropriate low bail from a previous crime. What type of bail reform, if any, do you think needs to happen in this state? And is there common ground with Republicans that you would be willing to work on? You know, absolutely. And, and, and Republicans and Democrats over the years have worked on uh, crime issues. Uh, and so I, I anticipate that's happening again. Yes, I've never said no bail. That, that's a ridiculous, that's to me a ridiculous position to be in. But I'm open to any good ideas that uh, will make sure that things like this don't happen again. We have to have significant ways to hold people if, uh, if uh, they're going to be a danger to the community. It's as simple as that. Your opponent has said he would fire John Chisholm because of what happened in the Brooks case. Sure. If you were to get the formal complaint that you need to do so, would you fire Chisholm? It there's certain uh, specifics that have to be met in order to make that happen. Do you have confidence in John Chisholm as Milwaukee County's district attorney? He's still in office and he is... Uh, but do you personally? I do, of course. I mean, he, they didn't meet the criteria to, uh, uh, to get, you know, to take him from office. And so he is the duly elected DA. I, any duly elected DA, I do have confidence in, whether it's somebody Republican or Democrat. This has been the most expensive race in the country, at least as of late, in terms of advertising and the amount of TV commercials. Everyone who's watching this is not immune to that. Republicans and Tim Michaels have really gone after you on the issue of parole most recently. Mm -hmm. Are you confident in the Parole Commission, in your commission 
as we sit here today that they won't release any more violent offenders that will go out and reoffend? Well, what I am confident in going forward is that they will do their job by making sure that victims have a seat at the table. That's part of their job, and uh, yes, I'm convinced that that will be. The Pro Commission worked uh, for Walker, it worked for Tommy Thompson, it worked for Doyle. They released more people than I did. Suddenly, suddenly, because uh, of an election, uh, it's a different story. Well, the parole commission is the parole commission. It's not something that I can do. You know, I have any control over. If I need to, I'll inter intervene when I see that victims aren't uh, at the table to provide their their uh, their testimony to the commissioners. And so that's that's the best I can do. Governor, I want to ask you um, about what critics are saying regarding your administration lacking urgency when it came to processing hundreds of thousands of unemployment claims, uh -huh. when it came to sending uh, law enforcement to Kenosha after the Jacob Blake shooting, when it comes to the granting and renewal of licenses for health care professionals and others who need those licenses to work. So what will it take for your administration to meet the needs of your constituents in a timely manner? Well, we. I I would argue we, we have been. You know, I, I understand where my opponents want to make hay on that issue. I'll use Kenosha as, a, as an example. You ask any one of the leaders in Kenosha that I that we dealt with, me or my administration, I did everything they asked me to do on a timely basis. Period. Right from the get-go, on the very first day that this that this uh, event happened. We, we got more state patrol into the area. We've got more people from surrounding counties in the area. At two o'clock in the morning, when the county decided to ask us for a National Guard, I we authorized that. We have to wait for some, we just can't say, all these people go over here because Evers tells you to do it. You have to have a request. We had a request at two o'clock in the morning. We had people on, on the ground that same day. We doubled that number every day. You can ask the sheriff in uh, uh, Kenosha County, who is a Republican, whether we did everything that we asked, they were asked of us, and we did. Do you bear any responsibility for those when you look at unemployment and, and the licensing? Well, the, un un well, the licensing, that, that's a real frustrating one for me personally because the people, the, the people that seek licenses pay a fee, and that fee goes to that department. That, so we should have plenty of resources in order to add staff. The Republican legislature said no, and they took they take the excess money away from that agency. So I'm not sure how we can continue to operate that way. We're gonna, we're gonna ask for, I think, another 30 people in the budget, and I hope the money is there to do it. Uh, we're gonna hope we can, but in the meantime, we've, we've done as much as we can to, to make it work in, in, in a good way. And we are in a place now where we're back to normal. Over your years, you've called numerous special sessions on issues important to Democrats when you look at gun reform or abortion or the budget. There are some Democrats who have said they don't think sometimes you fight hard enough for Democratic priorities up against the Republican legislature. What do you say to them? I say they're wrong. <laughs> I mean, I can't, I can't make a whole cloth out of something that isn't there. And uh, when, we, when we ask for a special session, we anticipate that the other side is going to be thoughtful and, and considerate. But you know they're not. They, you know they're not. They're going to gavel in and gavel out. Not every thing. time. They didn't with the, the agriculture one. They, they did not gavel out. They, they continued that on and eventually took care of some of those issues several months later. But we have to try. I mean, I, I'm not sure what other avenue we have other than a special session. Do you bear some of the blame for this inability to compromise with this legislature? Well, let's say, let's look at what happened before I even took office when we uh, uh, had the lame duck section and they took uh, powers away from myself and the attorney general uh, and signed into law by uh, somebody that was just defeated by me. But at the end of the day, people also have to realize that, you know, I know I vetoed a lot of laws, but two-thirds of the pieces of legislation in the, uh, that uh, came out of the legislature this last four years were signed by me. They, and out of those two-thirds, 99% of those bills, 99.5% of those bills, were, had Democrats that approved, that worked on that bill. So 
I know it's easy to sit back and say, well, there's never any compromise. Well, there is, and, uh, uh, and we're, I'm happy about that. It's still my job to make sure that bad language doesn't come, become law. Well, let me ask you about abortion, because you're going to need compromise if you hope for that initiative to go forward. As we sit here today, it's banned in Wisconsin, no compromise in sight. How can you say, if you are successful in November, that the next four years won't be more of the same, meaning that women in Wisconsin will not have access to abortion? We're going to do everything we can. This is a really important and personal issue for me. And uh, uh, the idea that we're operating under an 1849 law that was created one year after we become a, become a state, nothing but men in that legislature, I can guarantee you. And they decided that abortion is illegal that that's that we that's that's not a compromise position believe me my opponent obviously believes that that is a good law and he has gone as far as to say that exceptions for rape and incest are uh, are uh, are not going to happen under under his watch and so the lines are pretty pretty bleak here and uh, we're, we're, we're hoping that the Republicans will go along with Ron Johnson and say, hey, let's let the people of Wisconsin have, have the referendum initiative. We need to change the Constitution. We can do that and move forward. I, I think it's a good compromise. I always look at the ceiling of the, of the governor's conference room where it says the will of the people is the law of the land. Well, the way we're headed, it is not the will of the people, not even close. I want to check with you because Republicans have said that your agenda would have abortion available until birth. Do you support any limit as to when a woman can have an abortion? My belief is that whatever existed when the Dobbs decision went down in Washington, D.C., what, what existed here at that point in time, that's where we should be. That's where we were for the last 50 years in Wisconsin. And, uh, and so that's, that's, my, that's my position. Let's move to education. Sure. Uh, Republicans here in Milwaukee have proposed splitting up MPS in, into smaller districts. Recent testing showing just 10% of MPS students as proficient in math, 14% in language arts. With that, how do you defend the current system in place, and is this the best MPS can do? Of course not, of course not. But we also have to understand that education is obviously one of our most important duties as, as, a, as a state and as, as a 400 plus school districts. And, and that also means that we have to have a view that is more than just what's in the classroom. Uh, what kids bring to the classroom many times impacts their lives, whether it's mental health issues, whether it's frankly housing, whether it's about transportation, any number of those things impact how well they're going to do in a classroom. No, it's not acceptable. But I will say breaking up the school district is not that is, there's no data to support that that's a good idea. How are you going to keep qualified teachers in the classroom? Yeah, well, first of all, we should respect them more and we should pay them more. I think, uh, I think a lot of people are leaving the classroom because of uh, all the, the push. Where's the money going to come from? Republicans have already said your $2 billion proposal is not going to get it. Well, then they're going to, people go to referendum. And, and, and what have we accomplished by, by uh, saying that $2 billion can't go to, to go to public schools when it can? We have ma mammoth issues around mental health services all across, uh, all across the state in our schools. Let me ask you about the economy now. Sure. Um, inflation at record levels, people paying more for gas and groceries and rent. Is there anything you can do as governor to provide immediate relief? And if so, why haven't you done it? Oh. Good question. I proposed uh, to, to lower our gas taxes by 30, about 30 cents a gallon and also provide different tax credits uh, for people, especially around childcare. Two things would happen with that. That would lower people's burden uh, as, as this uh, inflation kind of plays out. And uh, it would also provide uh, possibly more childcare opportunities for people to come back into the workplace after the pandemic. I'd be glad to, and I've offered that to the Republicans, and they're, they're not interested. They don't want to give Evers a win before the election. It has been an eventful four years, to yes. say the least. I wonder if, as you look back, what was your toughest day on the job? Oh, gosh. Well, I, I, would, ha I would have to say the, uh, uh, the toughest day on the job was, uh, was Kenosha. Uh, that 
you know, it, it certainly looked like it was going to be serious. And, and when, as I said before, every time we are asked for uh, asked for help, uh, we, we provided that help. But at the end of the day, uh, we we worked real hard post uh, uh, post uh, civil unrest to. Uh, do whatever we could to build up the build up the city afterwards. But I, I'm not somebody that cottons to destruction and violence uh, as a way to uh, uh, make a point. And uh, it, it it hurts to see what happened in Kenosha. But at the end of the day, we did what we could, and um, uh, to see uh, see that happen was uh, that was not good for Wisconsin. When you look at the pandemic response, hindsight, of course, being 2020 and specifically looking at, at education, is there anything you would have done differently? Oh, in the pandemic? No. I followed the science. Uh, we, we, uh, uh, I, I know we've been criticized for the stay-at-home order. Well, lots of Republican governors did the exact same thing. And we saved lives. We saved lives all, every step of the way uh, along the path. Following the science as best we could, when we were blocked by the Supreme Court, we worked with counties all across the state, not just the big counties, all of them, to make sure they are providing good advice uh, and, and, and scientific advice to schools and municipalities and people. At the end of the day, it was uh, the, the ability of Wisconsinites to be resilient and work through this together when it became some, somewhat of a political football. If you had to grade yourself, Governor, on, on your first term, what grade would you give yourself? Oh, it's an incomplete. We've got a lot of, lot, of, lot of things yet to do. I mean, we've accomplished a lot. We've fought, we fought the pandemic the best way we knew how. Uh, we're in a good position economically as a state. Yeah, I absolutely want to work for more effective school districts in the state, and that includes some more resources. But we also, the issue around revenue streams for our counties and municipalities, are real, that's really important to me. What happens if you win and Republicans get a supermajority, veto-proof supermajority? It'll be a different Wisconsin. We'll see. Uh, the 1849 law for abortion uh, remain in place. Uh, we'll see the Wisconsin Elections Commission blown up. It's going to look like a different Wisconsin. Uh, voting rights, reproductive health rights, our public schools, you know, you think they're under attack now. Um, yeah, it'll be a different Wisconsin. I, I am going to win this race. Uh, I believe we're going to be in a position to hold the super veto from uh, happening. I hope that uh, we'll be able to maybe pass uh, three quarters of the laws instead of two thirds of the ones that uh, were brought to my desk. So we'll keep working for the people of Wisconsin and uh, doing the right thing. Governor Tony Evers, we appreciate your time. Thanks, you. Thanks to both Thank of you. you. Yeah. Thank you. Take care. The governor also answered questions about splitting up MPS, state students declining test scores, and why he claims he can't get tougher on the state parole board. You can see the entire interview on the commitment page of our website right now, WISN.com. Coming up, Republicans want to evict Tony Evers. Why business executive Tim Michaels thinks he's the person to do it. They know we're on the wrong side of the issues, and they know that we are going to win the governor's office on November 8th. His views on key issues, next.